Hello friends, uh, in the series which, were, which we are doing in the context of the history of India from 1750s to 1857, uh, we will talk about the revolt of 1857 uh, and we will see the causes and the consequences in this particular section that how uh, in the initial lecture uh, I talked about the Velour mutiny, I also talked about some of the other causes which were there the political causes were being discussed and now uh, following from the political causes, I will continue on the economic causes that how the kind of policy which was uh, followed by the British in the context of uh, the land revenue and various sections of the society peasantry, they faced a lot of oppression by the British and how from the many posts in the administration, we find that Indians, they were not being included. The Indian civil services was a close preserve of the British and Indians they were not being allowed to enter into the civil services. And even when the rules they were being framed with regard to the civil services, it was very difficult to get into the civil services because the open examination was being held in London initially and it was in Greek and Latin. And the age was around 23 years which was later reduced to only 19 years. So, that was the kind of a situation in which uh, uh, the British they were functioning and we also find that the various revenue settlements be it the permanent settlement, the Rayatvari settlement or the Mahalvari settlement. They wanted to create that kind of a situation where land became a commodity in India and the revenue demand was in all the three settlements was comparatively very, very high. And the kind of systems which were put in place by the British whether in the framework of the police or the law, court, law courts. So, it was very difficult for the common masses to, uh, to approach all these kinds of apparatus which were being created by the British and British they utilized all this kind of apparatus for themselves and uh, we find that drain of wealth from India to Britain in the frame initially they were making investments, they were taking a lot of goods from India which were finished products and uh, when they received the Diwani rights of Bengal, Bihar and Urissa, that, the, that revenue was being used to making uh, for making purchases in India and those goods they were being sent from India to Britain. So, from that way the uh, drain of wealth was happening. After that, uh, we find that when they needed raw materials for their industries, then these people they took a lot of uh, raw materials from India for when industrial revolution takes place in Britain. So, raw materials they were being exported and thereafter then they made investments in India in the context of the finance capital in the framework of the development of the railways as well as telegraph. So, we find that in the context of India, Indians they were suffering because of the kind of policies in the economic sphere which were followed by the British, how the artisans and the handicraftsmen uh, they were suffering because uh, many of the Indian states they were being annexed and these Indian states they were providing patronage uh, to many of uh, the people those who were associated with these kind of industries. So, now they were not getting any kind of patronage and how Indians uh, they were being discouraged at the cost of the British Indian handicraftsmen they were not able to secure any kind of support from the British rulers and many times we find that their manual skills in terms of uh, were comparatively quite high and uh, the machine made goods they were being sent from Britain uh, to India. So, that uh, these handicraftsmen they may not be able to compete uh, with the machine made goods which were comparatively cheaper and we find because of this. Uh, the decline of the Indian handicraft sector or deindustrialization because modern industries did not exist and whatever handloom and other kinds of industries which were existent, existent in India, they were also being challenged because of the policies of the British and all of them they declined because uh, of these policies. So, that, that phase has been referred by the historians as the stage of deindustrialization and we find that how not only uh, peasants by the triumvirate of Sarkar, Sahukar and Zamindar, but apart from that uh, other uh, other sections of the society they also were affected. For example, the tribals uh, they were affected uh, because of the policies which were followed by the British. Some of the readings which uh, you can refer is uh, Maja Pravas or the Aankho Dekha Gadar, it has been uh, translated by Amrit Lal Nagar uh, as Aankho Dekha Gadar. Uh, 
So, the, these are some of the readings which you can see as some sort of a primary source and these readings they have, uh, uh, they, they have been translated in English as well as uh, Hindi and uh, one can uh, see the eyewitness account of the revolt of 1857 by a traveler who, who came to North India from Maharashtra. And apart from the political and the economic causes which we have discussed earlier, the religious causes were also very very important because the missionaries those who were give, given the kind of facilities uh, uh, in 1813 act, charter act of 1813 missionaries they were being allowed to come to India and how missionaries in Shirampur near Calcutta they were able to position themselves and in other regions of India as well and the focus was to convert as many Indians uh, as possible to Christianity. And Sepoys uh, were promised promotions if they accepted Christianity. So, that was the kind of a situation where Indians they had to safeguard their own particular religion as well in the context of the policies which were followed by the British. And B Indians uh, when this kind of a situation came where greased cartridges uh, were to be used then sepoys they definitely felt that British they wanted to defile their religion. So, that they do not remain in that particular religion if they will use those cartridges. So, this this kind of a uh, this kind of a feeling or which was there in the Indians uh, could also be uh, visualized by the other sections uh, of the society not only army, but other sections and all of them they came together in some way that uh, even Sayyid Ahmad Khan he talks about uh, this idea that it was commonly believed that government appointed missionaries uh, and they maintained them at their own cost. So, Sayyid Ahmed Khan was appointed by the British, he was one of the British officials who was posted at Bijnor during the revolt of 1857 and he also gives uh, uh, this kind of an account that the government was appointing the missionaries and they were being maintained uh, at their own cost. So, when this kind of a situation will come and people will widely believe and the government was also doing such kind of activities where uh, the Christianity was being promoted at the cost of other religions, then uh, definitely it would not be liked by the natives as it was uh, there during this time as well. Then apart from that uh, another important factor was the religious disabilities act in 1856, uh, which modified the Hindu customs that uh, a change of religion would not debar a son from inheritance of property of his father. So, this act which came in 1856 uh, which was also modifying the Hindu customs that if a person changes uh, his religion for example, a son changes a religion uh, uh, from Hinduism to Christianity then, then also he will inherit the property of his father. So, it was uh, some kind of an indication that British they were supporting such kind of policies where the uh, conversion. Uh, was uh, they, uh, where they were supporting the conversion in every way that more and uh, more and more Indians they should convert to Christianity. Apart from that in the context of uh, religion we find that the Christian padres and they, they were also making some kind of efforts towards the education of women and uh, this was not liked uh, by some of the conservative sections of the society that how British and they would conquer them. So, education offices they were being uh, which were being set up by the British they were known as Shaitani Dafsars uh, by the Indians. So, Indians they felt that the introduction of education and how Indian women they will be educated by the British it was some sort of a ploy. So, that Indians are conquered by the British through the use of education. So, all these kind of things when they were being initiated at different levels whether in the uh, framework of the religion where British wanted to interfere or at the level of uh, social uh, codes, uh, social, uh, social rules which were there. For example, in the context of the social factors we find that uh, British they made laws with regard to Sati and uh, with regard to the widow remarriage. So, all these kinds of things which were very uh, prevalent in the society and uh, British they felt that they had to interfere in such kind of activities and people like Raja Ram Mohan Roy as well as Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar they were also uh, in favor of such kind of reforms. So, in the context of the social religious reform movements and British they introduced legislation on these issues and uh, 
uh, Radha Kant Dev in the context of the Dharma Sabha, he supported, uh, he came uh, against uh, the uh, Sati, uh, which uh, Sati agitation which was uh, initiated by the Raja Ram Mohan Roy. So, the conservative sections in the framework of Radha Kant Dev, Dharma Sabha, they were not uh, in, in this kind of a framework, they did not want that British should interfere or Sati should be done away with. So, all these kind of th things which were happening in the society because of the fact that conservative sections they did not want any kind of uh, interference of the British uh, officials in their own religion. Then racialism was another important factor where Indians they were called nigger, how they were treated uh, uh, in, in the society, how some sort of a feeling of disgust uh, came in the Indians towards the British rulers because of the way they were being referred uh, by the British. And public restaurants and clubs they advertised that dogs and Indians are not allowed and they were not even allowed and Indians they were paid at a very low levels. So, Indians were lowly paid because of the fact that they were considered to be corrupt convoys and other governor generals those who came they felt that Indians were corrupt in nature, but Indians were very uh, uh, were paid at a very low levels and on the other hand we find that the officials of the East India company were paid very high. And even after that uh, you find that cases uh, in, uh, the, they, in, uh, they indulge themselves in bribery and corruption. So, this kind of a myth uh, in the context of racialism that Indians uh, were corrupt in nature, uh, they could not be trusted that way, all these kinds of ideas they were also being uh, promoted which were not liked by the Indians, especially all sections of the society they felt that British were treating them as some sort of slaves, uh, that was the kind of treatment which was meted out to them. And uh, when uh, British they uh, in a way uh, interfered in the uh, social sector in the sati as well as the child marriage issue, then they felt that British they wanted to convert them into Christianity by interfering in their own religious practices. And when you tend to see the kind of uh, happenings which are there in the context of uh, the revolt and how British they reacted to the happenings in the revolt, we find that a number of counter insurgency measures they were there and how uh, the rebels they were being blown away because uh, from the cannons and native villages they were being burnt and how violence was some sort of a creed uh, of the British. Uh, Rudrangshu Mukherjee has also talked, he has talked about Awadin revolt, he has written a book called Awadin revolt uh, which talks about uh, the revolutionary activity uh, uh, during 1857 in Awad and how violence as a creed of the British. Uh, this kind of a violence which was both physical as well as psychological in nature. So, when one wants to understand the causes of the revolt of 1857, the military causes, the political causes, the religious as well as the social causes, all of them they come together, they multiply, they, they are long term as well as they are short term causes. They are long term in the sense that the, this kind of uh, this kind of feeling towards the British was developing over a period of time and the policies which were which they followed over a period of time whether in the framework of uh, the racial policy where they mistreated uh, the Indians. So, that kind of mistreatment was not liked by the Indians at all and they wanted uh, themselves to be fairly treated by the Indians and when they got an opportunity uh, where they felt that they can throw off the colonial yoke then at that point of time they revolt, uh, revolted. And if we see the causes of the failure of the revolt, uh, many a times it is argued that uh, this revolt was not uh, organized in a proper manner and how certain sections of the Indian society uh, they supported the British, uh, how many of the regions uh, they were not disturbed. For example, South India was not disturbed and how other sections those who supported the British, for example, Nepal's help proved of gr great help in the suppression of revolt. So, all these factors uh, if you see that how uh, revolt failed then uh, the localized presence that was one factor how it was restricted in only certain regions that is another how many of the army units like Bombay and Madras they were not affected only Bengal army it was affected and if Madras and Bengal uh, in Madras and Bombay both of them which were not affected. Uh, which remained loyal to the British, if they would have uh, supported the Bengal army, if they would have supported uh, the sepoys, 
then uh, the story would have been different. And how the other regions, for example, rulers of Nabha, Patiala, Jin, some of the Rajput states, uh, Sindhya, all of them, Nizam of Hyderabad, all of them, they remained loyal to the British. And when all these regions they remained loyal to the uh, loyal to the British, then it was very difficult. Uh, when all these people they supported the British for the, the for, for the for the people those who were in favor of revolt uh, to make it a success because they needed help from all 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 sorts of quarters which they were not getting. So uh, what we also find during this period is that uh, the resources uh, which were with the British. Uh, they were quite superior in that sense that they were able to get reinforcements at regular intervals while the uh, Indians they were fighting with the swords and spears British were equipped with modern weapons. So, this kind of a thing that uh, Indians they did not have money to they did not have that kind of technology they did not have uh, that kind of access to these kind of modern weapons and they were fighting with the primitive weapons. And on the other hand we find that British they were equipped with all sorts of modern weapons they were fighting with them. So, it was a complete mismatch that way, but even then uh, we find that it became very difficult for the British uh, to re recapture those areas uh, which became quite volatile during the revolt and it took them more than a year to get back to the normal state uh, status uh, which was prevalent. Uh, before the revolt of 1857. So, that kind of a situation uh, we, we see that uh, the revolt failed, but uh, if you see that uh, uh, how it became some sort of an inspiration for the later generations, because it could not muster that kind of a support uh, within its own regions, uh, otherwise, otherwise it would have been a great success. And how uh, because of the recent developments in the telegraph, in the railways, uh, we find that these kind of developments in the uh, in the telegraph and the railway sector it also helped the British because uh, uh, the movement of the troops during this time became comparatively easier because of uh, because of the railway and uh, the communications network also improved because of the telegraph. Uh, the Governor General or the Commander or the Commander in Chief uh, of the Army they could get. Uh, the information through telegraph in no time and with, with, with the arrival of information because of the telegraph they could send their troops at the appropriate places. So, this arrival of the technology which was uh, which was utilized during the revolt of 1857 uh, in the context of telegraph and the railway uh, which was not available to the Indians that way. So, it also played an important role in the failure of the revolt of 1857. Some things which have also been talked about by uh, the historians is that uh, rebel units they did not have any common plans of military action or authoritative heads or centralized leadership. So, if we see that naturally it was not planned that way, but important question is whether it was planned to that extent or, or not. So, many of the revolutions if you see the American revolution or the French revolution you do not find a wholesale participation of everyone. There are so many sections which have been quite loyal in these revolutions as well uh, to the people those who are ruling. So, it does not mean that if only some section of people they have revolted or they, they, they have led the uprising it does not mean that it was not it did not have any kind of national character it did not have wider participation. Because many a times it happens in the revolutions and it happened in early revolutions as well that not all sections of the society they have participated, but these revolutions became a success that is why we are trying to justify them and on the other hand 1857 has been rejected by uh, many scholars on these grounds because it was not a success. So, if you see the situation in the context of the failure then uh, it was deficient in experience, experience was not there and concerted operations they were also not being led and it did not have any kind of a forward looking program because many a times there some scholars they have talked about that it was a restorative nature it wanted to appoint again the it was it wanted to see the mughal emperor as the sole custodian of, of hindustan so from that point of view it was uh, restorative in nature it was going back to the feudal order it did not have a forward looking program it was not going in the direction 
where, but you uh, in, in a direction where they wanted some kind of a uh, modern or a, the, uh, some kind of a democratic state. But if you see the situation at international level as well, uh, then uh, uh, one one will realize that even if uh, the ruler of Hindustan, uh, who was say Bahadur Shah Zafar at that point of time, if he was asked to lead the revolt, then the revolt itself became some sort of a political act. So, when it was a political act, then why uh, why it is being rejected, why it is only being seen in the context of only being a sepoy mutiny. When we also see that some of the people, those who were there with the East India Company at that point of time, like Lawrence Brothers, Ottram, Havelock, Nicholson, they proved to be comparatively much more better in terms of their fighting abilities. They had these kind of services of these people at that point of time. And they also received reinforcements from abroad uh, because the war with China, war, the Crimean War, uh, they ended by 1856. So, more than 1 lakh troops they got freed uh, during that time and all of them they reached India uh, when, that, uh, when, it, uh, when they were being needed. So, such kind of reinforcements which were available, available to these people uh, made the situation comparatively precarious for the Indian troops. What we also find uh, after the revolt of 1857 is that uh, crown it got the kind of control uh, of uh, the uh, control of India and uh, the administration was transferred from East India Company to the crown with the Queen's proclamation of 1st November 1858. And Queen's proclamation it talked about the desire for the extension of territorial possessions would not be there, it did not want it. And it, it also promised to respect the rights, dignity and honor of native princes as their own. So, what was, what, what was being done uh, earlier, now it was to be reversed. This is what the Queen's proclamation talks about that no territorial possessions uh, would be extended now and princely states they will be treated with the kind of dignity and honor uh, which they deserve. So, so that uh, these kind of elements uh, th which could uh, which could help the British, uh, they, they, they should be kept loyal. And many of the princes during the revolt of 1857 had supported the British, many of the zamindars they had supported the British. So, they acted as some sort of breakwaters in the storm of 1857 we realize. And uh, what we find that uh, if uh, this situation where the crown uh, becomes the real ruler of India in 1858. So, that kind of a duality which was there earlier uh, that East India Company was ruling India on behalf of the British crown that was done away with and the and the uh, uh, now the British crown was directly will now will directly rule India and this kind of a situation where the political sovereignty of India was given to someone who was not even there in India. So, Queen became the Empress of India that way and Crown will uh, take care of the affairs of India. For that, uh, uh, a committee was formed where you have the Secretary of State, you have 15 members uh, and the Secretary of State was stationed in Britain and the 15 members they were also there in Britain and uh, they will devise the ways how to govern India and uh, Viceroy and the Governor General as it was there earlier times as well, the governor general was there, they will be sent and uh, from Britain to rule India. And even in those 15 members, uh, 7 members will be uh, from the board of uh, uh, control, uh, from the court of directors. So, uh, this kind of a East India company, company's role uh, was there during this time as well, it did not change much, the situation did not improve and thereafter uh, these members uh, they will be elected by uh, the committee itself. So, initially they will be elected and thereafter uh, they will be nominated and thereafter uh, they will be no nominated by the committee itself. So, that was the kind of thing which was initiated during this time and we also find that uh, uh, the uh, proclamation also talked about that how Indians they will not be discriminated uh, on any basis, they will also be part of the administration. But what we find is that uh, this was not followed and uh, Indian Civil Services Act of 1861 was there and it wanted to maintain uh, the civil services as a very close preserve. And uh, the British when they talked about that they will not interfere, generally they did not interfere in the social aspects and now their motive changed 
uh, for uh, to, to the to the extent that now they wanted to exploit India on a more larger scale. So, that was the kind of thing which we find during this time and uh, this also found, found some kind of uh, uh, reaction when Indians they were denied all sorts of aspirations educated Indians they will not share power. So, naturally this kind of a frustration which came and all sections of the society they felt frustrated not only educated ones, but the others as well. And later we find that all this frustration could be seen in the ideas of nationalism and the national movement. And we also find after the revolt of 1857, the army was reorganized by the British uh, on the principles of the division and counterpoise, where uh, uh, the some kind of a counterbalance will be exercised. And the strength of the East India Company troops, it was increased during this period, where you will find that in the Bengal army, uh, 1 is to 2, the ratio was to be kept that for every uh, 2 Indian soldiers, 1 European soldier would be there. And in the context of the Madras and the Bombay armies, uh, one will find that 3 is to 1 ratio was to be maintained. And the idea of the martial races was also created during this time that the, that the units or the troops which supported the British. Uh, for example, Punjab as well as the Gorkhas, they, they were considered to be martial. And on the other hand, the people or the sepoys, those who revolted, they were considered to be non-martial in nature. So, this kind of a racial approach, it became more pronounced during this period. And this racial bitterness, where the idea of white man's burden, uh, where British, they had to civilize uh, the natives, that was also was talked about that, that Indians, they were savage in nature and they had to be, uh, it was a duty, it was a divine duty of the British uh, to civilize these, it was the burden of the white man to civilize uh, the savage. So, these were the kind of things they were being promoted as well as the policy of the divide and rule, it was also being followed uh, on, in, on the larger scale. We find that British, uh, they wanted to divide the Indians, they wanted to create, they did not want that the unity which was shown by the Hindus as well as Muslims during the revolt of 1857 uh, should be exhibited in the uh, future as well. So, this idea of communalism which develops later was also the handiwork of the British because of the policy which was being followed by them. Then uh, Christopher Bailey talks about the 1857 as many movements, then he cites various reasons that it was not one movement, but it was many movement. And he cites different reasons for the revolt by different sections and he cites uh, Eric Stokes work, uh, work for that. But it does not mean that when you talk, talk about 1857 as many, many movements. So, the, the credit should not be taken away. But if uh, different sections of the society, they were revolting against the, against the British for different reasons. So, it shows the unpopularity of the British among all the sections. And revolt, if we want to see revolt, it, uh, it was some sort of an inspiration for the entire generation that how uh, the people, those who were associated with the revolt, they wanted to defy or challenge the mighty colonial empire. And in the popular culture as well, we find that some of the films which were made later, uh, for example, Jhansi Ki Rani by Sohra Modi, uh, how Jhansi Ki Rani fought valiantly for her own rights and for uh, her vatan. And later it was also made as uh, Mani Karnika in recent times that uh, the uh, same story, uh, how it was retold later. There were other films which have also uh, talked about uh, the people, those who were associated with the revolt of 1857. Uh, for example, Mangal Pandey, uh, 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 an uprising uh, arising uh, which all uh, in which Amir Khan acted. So, all these kinds of uh, cultural expressions in the literature, in uh, film, in cinema and other fields, uh, they also express uh, the revolt of 1857 in numerous ways. So, I would like to end the discussion here. Thank you very much.